having trouble with the with uh, Comcast Wi-Fi. Brother Painter's upstairs working on that, so uh, that's why he's not at the table this morning. I, uh, yesterday we had uh, a body ministers meeting on Zoom. Some people, I'm sure, aren't probably aware of it, but we have a, we're having a Zoom meeting every month now. Yesterday, I think there was 293 people on there, primarily ministers, but uh, it's not. You know, in other words, people can get in it and listen. Um, and I thought it was a very good meeting. It seems like the brethren, are, God's dealing with the brotherhood um, pretty well all the way across, seems like. That, um, on humility and, and uh, charity having the just having the right spirit um, maybe trying to get back to brother Souders's foundation on uh, I, I really appreciated brother Benfield I talked to brother Truman Benfield quite a bit on the phone and uh, he's just really been getting a lot out of Matthew 5 6 and 7 which we've always taught that's those are foundation teachings of Christ for the body of Christ. And um, they're saying I need to be turned up a little bit, Brother Painter. Uh, so can you hear me? Is that better? That's good right there. So um, anyway, so I appreciated you could really feel his spirit about uh, talking about uh, and he started off talking about uh, blessed are the poor in spirit and uh, and I was telling Brother Durham that you know I've been talking some on the, the Ten Commandments of late and <clears throat> and showing how the first four commandments are have to do with your relationship with God and then the other six are and, and those first four are, uh, you should have no other God before me he's a jealous God and um, number two is <clears throat> that you're to make no graven image or have no idols and number three is <clears throat> that you're not to take the, the Lord thy God's name in vain. Of course, I taught that that doesn't mean to curse with God's name. That means to use his name for your own benefit. Um, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people declare to be Christians, but their life, obviously so, they're not. That's, they're taking God's name in vain. Uh, when you use God's name, as I said, to be, to benefit from, that's that's vanity. <clears throat> and uh, and then the fourth one is to keep the Sabbath holy. And of course, we know that that is that script, that that uh, commandment is fulfilled in <clears throat> receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost under the new covenant of grace and uh, that we're to cease from our labors that's what that's a picture of all the way through in keeping the Sabbath holy uh, really we're supposed to keep every day holy but God gave them one day and was very emphatic under the law about them not working on that day <clears throat> and for them to understand God's emphasis on a, on a day of rest. Uh, 
And so then the other six are, are uh, how we relate to our brother, our interaction with our brother. Thou shalt not, uh, thou shalt honor thy father and thy mother, that your days may be long, lengthy on earth. That's the first commandment with promise. That's the first one that gives you a promise that you're going to have. If you learn order and learn how to reverence authority, then your days on earth will be extended. And that part of that's natural. Uh, and then <clears throat> thou uh, shall not kill is the next one. That's kind of interesting that God would put thou shall not kill before uh, some of the others. But it does have to do, it ties in with honoring your mother and your father. You know, if you, did, if you don't honor them, you're actually killing their influence in your life. And, uh, and the same with God. If you don't learn to honor God properly and have the right relationship with him, then you've, you've uh, how, under the new covenant, John said you crucified Christ afresh. And so I can understand why God put that in there next. And, and then thou shalt not commit adultery. Uh, that's not just uh, natural adultery, but it has to do with uh, the uh, not maintaining an intimate place with God in your heart. Spiritual adultery is where you, where you put anything up above an idol, something that anything that you put above God is, uh, is, is, is it would be committing spiritual adultery. And uh, <clears throat> And I might say something about this in a little while, but Babylon is called the mother of harlots. It's, un, it's, it's important to understand what the body of Christ is and what's the difference in the body of Christ and all these other churches that are out here. There's not very many churches in the body of Christ today. There's not very many people that has a revelation of even what the body of Christ is. These other churches are Babylon and 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 by and the Bible calls them, calls Babylon the mother of harlots. That means she's got lots of daughters. And I know when we talk on that it it's so it seems so critical towards our brothers and our sisters that are out there but we do have to be critical to understand the, a harlot system that is worshiping God outside of God's order and outside of God's truth. They're not looking for truth anymore out there. They're, they're satisfied with what they've got, and it, none of it. Uh, you know, here's a strong statement. Not one person will be saved and have everlasting life in Babylon. Not one. They cannot take you to, to everlasting. Now, you might get a resurrection, but you're going to have to wind up in the body of Christ in that resurrection. A lot of people don't understand the fact that the, 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 a resurrection is a natural resurrection unless it is the, unless it is the resurrection under everlasting life which only is to the bride of Christ and to those who finish their course and overcome sin. The cost or the requirement is exactly the same for every person that inherits everlasting life. You have to overcome sin. You have to reach perfection in the flesh. And, well, I mean, in, in this body. So everyone is going to get a resurrection. There's a, a lot of people that thinks that when, you know, I read on Facebook, people in the body just blows my mind talking about, you know, mama's in heaven looking down on us and, you know, and all of this. When they ought to know they're not in heaven. They're in the grave. They have, they've went back to dust. And that's where they're going to be until there's a resurrection 
unless they made the bride. <laughs> it's important to understand these things, uh, to understand, you know, somebody said yesterday, said, you're not going to go to heaven if you don't understand who your enemy is. If you're fighting, a, if you're, if you're fighting against an enemy and you don't know who he is, you're going to be in trouble if you don't know what you're fighting. Well, if you don't know who the Lord is and what his, what his requirements are for righteousness, you're not going to make it either. So the, those, these things are important. Um, let me I say I'll just go ahead and finish. Uh, what was the last one I mentioned? Thou shalt not kill, shall not commit adultery. Uh, I mainly leaned on the side of, of spiritual adultery because, of course, uh, natural adulteries also. But uh, fornication. Fornication is the mother word for all um, illicit um, sex, whether, whether it's natural or spiritual. It could be spiritual fornication or natural fornication. The mother word, which would in, include uh, homosexuality, bestiology, you know, Adultery, all of, all of the categories fall under fornication. Then thou shalt not steal. I guess that goes along with adultery too, don't it? <laughs> when you, you, if you pick up something that you're not supposed to be, have, well then that would be attached to it. Then thou shalt not bear false witness or, you know, Thou shalt not lie. And that's a, that's a you know, uh, we got to be careful about truth, about getting truth instilled in our lives. I was reading one of Frank Hetzel's poems yesterday about, I wish I had the book with me, I'd read it to you, about, uh, he was talking, he had a little poem about, about this guy that told the truth no matter what. And uh, it, you know, he he paid a price for it because he got in trouble for telling the truth a lot. Anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, but there is a cost. Truth has a cost to it. You know, a lot of people uh, would would rather chase a lie than the truth. Some people would rather tell one than the truth. You know, you tell me not to do it, and that you catch me almost doing it. I might say, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't fix me to do that. Not me, but you. <laughs> Did you get it? Anyway, um, and then um, thou shalt not covet. So, <clears throat> anyway, those are the ten we've been working on. I, I might have been going to work a little bit on uh, <clears throat> on. Uh, Thou shalt not kill today. I, I don't think I'm going to talk on that right now. But, but it has a lot more to do with just. It's like it's like the others that there's a lot more to it than just physically taking someone's life. I mean, you can kill someone's influence. That's what you know. Like yesterday, we were working on the ministry was working on having the right spirit towards your brother. Even you know, in other words. Do we have the right spirit in the body of Christ? Uh, Brother Richardson really did a good job, I thought, and talked on uh, uh, on uh, making a, a difference in how you accept or reject a person, maybe just because of their personal appearance. Are because of their character or behavior, uh, but Brother Souders taught us many years ago uh, the foundation to this body was to uh, to love your brother as yourself. In fact, Paul said to esteem others higher than yourself. 
he asked that question. Do you esteem uh, do you esteem others higher than yourself? Uh, you know how how much what did Paul Paul said? No, it was Peter, wasn't it? When he said that. Uh, if we suffer for wrongdoing, you know, that, that's really to be expected. But how many people will suffer when they're doing right? They're doing good and, and they're suffering for it. You know, that, that moves into a lot of areas like, uh, you know, sorry. Um, charity charity suffereth long and is kind and be kind okay well that's true you know because it does uh, <clears throat> I mean you, you could go in a lot of directions with that you know of how uh, you know e even in church you know a rela our, our relationship our, with each other we, we interact, you know, the band members interact with each other. There's things happen in the band that, you know, that uh, can get under your skin if the guy next to you gets a little curt with you or, or says something about maybe how you, you're dressed or why you didn't show up for practice or, you know, they decide to be your corrector. And, or if you're just, you know, come to church and, if you're on a working team, or maybe maybe you get offended and won't come, maybe you won't come and do and, and help out anymore because somebody offended you, and you think you know you got a right to do that. <laughs> what kind of spirit is that? You know, that's you're not willing to you're not willing to suffer wrong, and 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 take it and let God deal with it in time. It, you know, there's all kinds of things that is involved here with our interaction with each other but I like what brother Benfield was saying yesterday he was saying blessed are the poor in spirit and then he read on down to the 24th verse in Matthew 5 where it said uh, if if your brother has ought against you to go to your brother and reconcile <coughs> I asked him to talk a little bit about the fact that you can't always reconcile I mean you know, I said, would you, would you bring up that part of how, what that means? How, you know, what if you can't reconcile? And he finally said it, which I wanted, that's what I wanted him to say is, you have to have, and I have to have, the spirit to make things right with my brother. If I've offended my brother, go and go to your brother, reconcile your difference, and then bring your gift to the altar. God ain't going to accept your gift till you do. But what if they won't accept? What if you can't reconcile with them? Well, the spirit of the Word of God that is being taught there, the foundation is you got to have the spirit to be a peacemaker. you got to have a, that spirit to love your brother anyway, or your sister. And if they won't accept it, and they won't reconcile, then they are the, then the ball's in their court, and you're free to take your gift to the altar. But the, the spirit of the letter is what we're interested in here, is the spirit of what Christ was saying. See, he, he dealt with things like he said, it, you know, he, he, he mentioned, uh, turn to the fifth chapter of, of Matthew right quick, if you would. And I don't think, I probably won't be labor on this very too long, but, but uh, uh, <clears throat> blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, and we might ought to go through these. I don't think there's anything more important than, than getting this, this spirit of, of righteousness, the spirit of Christ. Was it? I think it was Brother Johnny Miller that brought up yesterday in, uh, in Romans 8, 
where it says, if you have not, he that hath not the spirit of Christ is none of his. And he was just saying, that's not talking about the Holy Ghost, that's talking about if you don't have the Christ-like spirit, if you don't have this spirit, the love of God, you're, you're, then we're, you're, you're operating in Adam. You're not operating in the inner man, new man that is born of Christ. But that's what these, this is talking about. Blessed are the meek. They'll inherit the earth. That sort of helps you to understand the earth's going to always exist. The meek's going to inherit it. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled. You know, I've told people, I had, I remember Brother Joe Suttmiller's brother, Bill Suttmiller. Of course, you know, their mother and my mother were sisters, so we were first cousins, and we're very close growing up in, in our childhood. <clears throat> and uh, when Brother Bill, Brother Bill, uh, he was nine years older than me. He's been dead now for, I don't know, 20 years, I guess. He had diabetes so bad that it just finally, he, he finally lost his eyesight and went completely blind. He lost his kidneys. He was on dialysis for several years. And he just, every organ in his body, he, he just had diabetes so bad. He was, when he was young, he used to talk to me and I used to get on to him, you know, because he'd eat two pieces of pecan pie and I'd say, Bill, his blood sugar generally ran three to four hundred. That's what it was pretty normal for him. And uh, I, uh, I told him, I said, Bill, diabetes is a silent killer. I said, you know, he said, I, I'm not, I am not going to eat like they want me to. He said, I'll just take more insulin. And that's what he did. He just took more insulin. But it still killed him. You know, it just ate every organ up in his body. And, of course, not every diabetes is as severe, diabetic, is as severe with it as he is, but but it is a silent killer. It really is. It destroys, it destroys. I'm thankful that I don't have diabetes, but, of course, you can get it, what they call geriatric diabetes. When you get older, if you don't watch your body a little better, because nothing in your body works as good. See, I, don't, I, I started to say your mind might work all right, but your body, but I think I think your mind deteriorates some too. <laughs> you have to work at it now. That's what I'm doing. I'm trying to I'm trying to I wish when I was young I would have exercised my mind a little bit more. I'm now I'm trying to memorize things. I go to bed saying, you know, with some of my memorization because I want to keep my mind sharp as I get older, but because I can tell you right now, I'm trying to do things with my, my body, but it ain't making as much difference as working on my mind is. At least that's the way it feels. You know, you might be following me around saying you don't realize your mind's going with it, but <laughs> anyway, I'm hanging on as long as I can. Uh, anyway, what I was going to say was, as Brother Bill used to tell me, he used to say, Brother Smith, I don't have what y'all got. I want it. I said, Brother Bill, that's look at that scripture. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst. I said, you keep wanting it and keep asking God for it, and I'll promise you God's going to give it to you. I said, but keep doing what you're doing. He was going out, and he had a little 10-foot square shed out in his backyard, and he'd go out there every day. He built him a little counter and he set his Bible on he'd read it read and he'd pray out there by himself and I told him I said keep doing what you're doing and keep earnestly asking God and I'll promise you God will give you a vision of this body and God will give you the righteousness and the truth of God's word he will he'll uh, he'll give that to you and he did the Lord gave him he, he became really a good good man of God good pastor and and he was a good preacher. Um, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you all something. God's been so merciful to me. It scares me. If I, if I feel myself being less merciful to somebody, I get fearful. I, they, 
God's going to probably, you know, y'all know the parable Jesus gave about the guy that, you know, he, he, was, given, he was forgiven great debt, and uh, then he had somebody that hold him a, just a small amount. And, I mean, he wanted, the guy, he wanted to throw the guy in the dungeon, you know. So the judge went back to him, the guy that was forgiven so much debt and, and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take him away my judgment. I'm going to make you pay everything. And he was just showing, Jesus was showing, you know, God's watching us. And if we're not merciful like we've been shown mercy, and every one of us have are, I've often said, you know, I don't like to hear people say I'm a nobody, I'm, worth, I'm worthless. I don't like that. I, I would say this. It's true about your old man. Your old man is worth less than nothing. <laughs> it is sold under sin. Corrupt. It was corruptible. But when God gave you life and you were born again, you became the child of God. Now you are somebody. And you don't want to take that, you know, it's okay to admit that there's a, there was a part of me before I met Christ that was worthless. But today, he's changed me, and he's put a worth in my life, and there's righteousness working in me, and I'm not, I don't want to get exalted with that. I don't want to be humble about the fact that I, I, I was, it was a gift from God. I didn't earn it. It was a gift that he forgave all my sins, counted me righteous, and now he is helping me to work out true righteousness in my life. And that there is a cost. There's a price there. For you to sell everything you have and go buy the pearl or the field wherein lieth the pearl of great price, that, that's a pri that you got to sell everything. you got to sell out to God can't maintain anything for yourself. Uh, blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Pure heartedness. I like that. I always I used to say that uh, Brother Leniger operated in a category that was different from a lot of men that I worked with and knew and that he was he had a great purity in his heart to a point he was almost naive he 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 just accepted everything from face value almost now i'm not telling you he was perfect cuz i knew him pretty close and i know he he wouldn't claim that but he 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 really worked on himself, and he was he had a pure heart. Uh, blessed are the peacemakers, for they'll be called the children of God. And I uh, is it the thirty fourth chapter of Psalms where it says, "Seek peace and pursue it." <laughs> it's not something. It's like gold. You don't just find find it laying around on the ground. You got to work. You have to work get peace working you have to seek it you got to look for it you got somebody that's you're not at peace with you you need to to work on that and try to to get peace worked out with them uh, blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness sake there's where I mentioned before about Peter saying you know if you if you suffer wrongfully that, that, there's a great price in that. The, the Lord will recognize Jesus. The Lord, wasn't he an example of that? So theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. So you will suffer because, like I've said many times, we're like salmon swimming upstream, you know. Everybody else is going downstream. We're fighting it to go go up upstream, and everything's against us. Everything in this world's against you. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. 
so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if you shall, if, if, if the salt has lost its savor, there's where I think we are to all work on that and ask God to help us maintain salt. That, that's talking about, you know, salt is a, is a preserver. Salt keeps uh, corruption from taking place. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if, if we're the salt of the earth and we lost our sa sa savor, where, where, where's it going to be salted? In other words, if, God, if there wasn't anyone in this earth that had righteousness and served God and had salt in their life, I'm, I'm actually working right now trying to get back on this foundation. I think I've been off of it a little bit, and I'm asking God to help me really get on a foundation where my righteousness, uh, His righteousness in me, is really manifesting itself. That I could... Uh, he doesn't only say you're just the salt of the earth, but you're you're the light of the world. That that makes it a little bit clearer. You you ought to be lighting things up concerning the things of God with anybody that gets around you. Maybe I should say I should be. This is a personal thing. But what I liked about what brother good what brother Truman Benfield said, he said, These things are doable. You can do this. You're, you're, you may not be per perfect to do it, but you can do it. It's livable. I like. He said that several times. I like the way he put that. That it's doable. Living for God and doing the right thing is doable. Um, I, I want to say a little bit more about the body of Christ. Uh, you know, the... I, I talked a little bit about the um, um, spiritual adultery. Uh, if you look in your Bibles in Revelation, the 17th chapter, I'm going to get off of what I was talking on a little bit because I think we need to be reminded from time to time where we are and what a blessing it is to be in the body of Christ. Um, and and John, this the angel is he doesn't he doesn't cut too much slack here concerning his phraseology and his statement about Babylon. Look what it says. Let's just start in the first verse. There came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come, up, come here, come hither, and I'll show unto thee the judgment of the great whore which setteth upon many waters. That's strong language. With whom the kings of the earth had committed fornication. See, that word fornication is spiritual. That's not talking about natural. And the inhabitants of the earth have made been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Wine has to do with your spirit. You know, uh, uh, Proverbs, uh, isn't it the ninth chapter that says, Wisdom has builded her house, she's hewn out her seven pillars, she's killed her beast, she's mingled her wine. That's yeah, talking about us interacting with each other. We're, you know, we're not talking about having Mogan David here today. I don't have no Mogan David. <laughs> I don't know. I can't think of another one to say. I'm not a wine. I never was a wine drinker. But I, I used to, I used to sell. I used to work in a gro. I used to be a grocery store manager, and and uh, we sold Mogan David. I can remember that. We used to have drunks come in and they couldn't afford wine, so they'd buy flavored uh, 
like vanilla. What, what, that, the, there's different flavors of, what do you call that stuff, Sister Tally? Extract. That's it. They'd go in there, they'd come by four or five of them little bottles. You know, they'd go drink them four or five bottles of extract. Keep them wound up, I guess. I never tried it, but I knew that's what they was doing with it. Well, we're talking about our spirit, and it's not just mingling your spirit with me and you and your brother and your sister, but it's also mingling our spirit with the Lord. I don't know how many of you realize sometimes we have church and the Lord comes in, but it's kind of shallow. You all get that from time to time? We just, sometimes God comes in just dumps that deep, heavy, wonderful Spirit of God on us. And I know that the Lord's doing that so we can tell the difference. But sometimes it's just pretty shallow. And that just lets you know that there's more flesh in there than there is God. And God's wanting us to get to the place where we can usher in the, the Spirit of God. You know, where we can be in an attitude and, and in a place where the Spirit of God is comfortable. And we can actually enhance our services and by ushering in the Spirit of God, God wants us to learn how to do that. And so He dumps the Spirit on us from time to time to help us know the difference between that. You know, sometimes we're going down the runway, but we don't never get up in the air. We're just running down the runway. Feels pretty good sometimes, just to be going pretty fast. You know, feel like you're fixing to get airborne, but just never did quite get off the runway. But then there's sometimes that God just. It's like a helicopter. We don't even have to go down the runway. We just, woo, we just go up. God just lifts us up. Well, the Lord's trying to teach us something there. And, and uh, so <clears throat> here this, this harlot sitteth upon many waters, verse 2, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and they've drunk of the wine of her fornication. In other words, she's committing spiritual adultery or spiritual fornication with what she's calling the Lord in her religious condition, but it's fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit of the wilderness, and I saw a woman set upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, <clears throat> having a cup in her hand full of abominations of filthiness of her fornication. See, those are spiritual things that comes from the Word of God and the Spirit of God. It's like being married, but then you, you cheat on your spouse. You start messing outside of God's order in a religious system that's not of God, but you take the things of God in there, and those that have built that system have got God's things in there, but they're building it with the spirit of man. Remember, the, the mark of the beast is 666. The number of man is six. He was created on the sixth day. And he, he, man's made up of body, soul, and spirit. And the system of Babylon, which is this harlot system, the body of it is man-made. It's an organization that men have put together. It's not built by Jesus Christ. It doesn't have the earmarks of the New Testament church. And then <clears throat> the soul of it, or the mind of it, the, the doctrine of it is man's doctrine. Man's doctrine is woven into some truth. There's almost every religion, almost every organization out here. Somebody, I think it was yesterday, I believe, that someone mentioned that, uh, that the nine Supreme Court justices, six of them are Catholic. One of them is Episcopalian, and two of them 
are Jews. There's not a there, there, there's not a Christian in the group that outside of Catholicism, but there's not a Protestant in the group. That's what I should have said, maybe. And uh, they mentioned that Joe Biden is the second uh, if he's if he's becomes a president. Uh, He's the second Catholic president. Of course, he's he's not even a real good practicing Catholic. But but anyway, <clears throat> uh, anyway, verse three said, "So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman set upon a scarlet colored beast. Scarlet's red. That's sin. That's what it depicts. Full of names of blasphemy." Remember what I said about thou shalt not blaspheme the name of the, your Lord, the Lord your God? You're not to use his name for your own benefit. And that's what these religious groups do. All these different organizations claim to know Christ, but you cannot be the body of Christ and be a, a group that separates yourself from another group. Uh, I mean, you can't be a part of an organization. Jesus wouldn't have never became a part of the Pharisees, Sadducees, Elamites, Essians, Cretans, or any of those secular groups back there. But he, he was open to all of God's people to work in God's order. He would not become a part of a, a fornicating group, spiritual fornication. Uh, full of... Uh, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple, scarlet colored, decked with gold, precious stones, pearls, having a cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken, with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. That's part of what I was uh, mentioning about thou shalt not kill. See, just be... Now, this is... Many people here are, were literally martyred. Jesus was the first uh, martyr under the new covenant. He... Uh, but there were there's many people that have been cut off that maybe they weren't literally killed their physical body was killed but they they were excluded from you know uh, different religious groups because they wouldn't agree uh, wouldn't become a part of that group wouldn't take some of the oaths or uh, accept some of the teachings of the group. And, uh, and I think in the body of Christ, we, we have to, you know, before this is over with, every kind of person you can imagine is going to come in here. And we're going to have to love them. We, we cannot shun them. Uh, in fact, we need I was just thinking this morning, I thought, I wonder how many people I could get to commit to me that they would invite, let's just say in January, they would invite one person to this church every week. If you just had to walk up to a stranger and say, look, my, I promised my pastor I would invite somebody and it's Saturday and I'm running out of time and here's a church card, I'm inviting you to come to my church so I don't break my promise to my pastor. And I thought, I wonder how many people would do it. How many people could I get to do that? You know, that's just like going fishing and throwing, throwing your hook in the water. I mean, you ain't going to catch a fish if you ain't even got a pole. You ain't even going to throw a hook in the water. But, you know, if, if we had... You know, seven people that invite somebody in January. Another seven invite somebody. If we invited seven people every week to this church, surely to God we'd get somebody to come see. After a while, what would that be? Seven people a week times 52 is 350. 
uh, let's see, 7, 5 is 35, that's 350, and then 14 be 364, am I right on that? 364 people a, a year we'd invite to church. I wonder how long has it been since 364 people have been invited here. See, we don't want to get this thing turned into us four and no more. But we can get so busy in our lives that that we're not doing too great of a job of inviting people to the wedding. <laughs> uh, Verse 7 says, The angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I'll tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carried her, which hath seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to the, into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And so he, he goes on here, but first he tells who this harlot is. Now go down to the 18th chapter real quick. I just want to I, I want to reiterate, I've, I've saw, said this many times, sometimes I feel like people lose sight of where they are. This, the very fact that you people have a vision of the body of Christ, that's why some of you drive 45 minutes an hour to church because there's not another body of Christ church anywhere within it's over a hundred miles from here of any church being in the body of Christ well how far is it to, to Russellville it's not a hundred miles 60 some odd miles 80 I guess that'd be the closest one and Memphis would probably be the next Fort Smith maybe huh Batesville. How far is it to Batesville? About an hour or something like that. So it's that distance. That's why people drive. Uh, is because they know there's not anywhere else I can go unless I want to go to to Babylon. you got to have a vision to do that, to, to be willing to suffer to make those these sometimes these drives instead of just going to some church you know you you can go where there's they they'll have the spirit of god because god and has a lot of people there let's let's read right here in 18th verse right quick and after these things i saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and earth was lightened with his glory and he cried with a mighty and strong with a strong voice saying babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit in a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Well, that ain't talking about birds that tweet, tweet. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies, and I heard an, another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Now, we just learned in the 17th chapter that Babylon is a harlot. In fact, the angel used a lot stronger word than harlot. Put it, God had them put it right in the Bible. Come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her sins, that you receive not her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven the God, and God has remembered her iniquities, reward even her even as she rewarded you and double unto her, double according to her works in the cup which she hath filled to her double. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her, for she saith in her heart, I said a queen and am no widow, and see no sorrow. In other words, there ain't nothing wrong with me. They, they, they proclaim to be a part of Christ's church and see nothing wrong with what they're in. They don't even ever check it. They don't even ever 
see what the Bible has to say about it. Therefore, plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord who judgeth her. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication and live deliciously with her, shall bewail her and lament for her, <clears throat> and they'll see the smoke of her burning, standing far off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour, that's the prophetical hour, 15 years, is judgment come. I just want to say this to you. You see, God's <clears throat> he's so merciful he will wait till the last prophetical hour to judge that system because before God judges that system, he will finish his restoration of the church in the body of Christ. And there will be a church on this earth like the New Testament church you read about in the New Testament. And God will harvest this world and that's when you will hear this Heart in the very in the fourth verse, come out of her, my people. God will get all his people that he can out of these systems of man made religious Christianity. There's not any way you could believe that there, these organizations is biblical. There's not one thing biblical about it. There's no there there's no nothing in the New Testament about how these organizations are set up. God will harvest this world and get those as many people out of that as he can get out of it before he judges it. But he is going to judge it. Right now, right now, I could read you the scriptures, but we're out of time. But right now, the sound of the millstone, you know, a millstone's when you, they took wheat, they took a big rock bowl, they took a rock stone, they put wheat in there, and they ground it with a millstone and ground that wheat to powder so they could make bread out of it. Spiritually, we're grinding at the mill the wheat of the Word of God to make the bread of life out of it. And Babylon's grinding at the Word of God, and we're grinding in it. There's two women grinding at the mill. But... The sound of the millstone, when God judges this, will be heard no more at all in her. Whatever craftsman, whatever musician, whatever message is being taught out there by a true gift is still out there, but when God judges it, it will be heard no more at all in her. The sound of the bridegroom and the sound of the bride will be heard no more at her. See, right now, you can go out here, you can feel God in some of these places because God wants to keep them people alive until he can get them out of that. Thank God one day God opened my eyes and I saw the body of Christ. And I saw the truth of the Word of God that I never heard out there. I was raised out there. But I was hungry and God fed me and God brought me. And when I found this, I knew I found my mother. I knew I found the, the remnant of the true church of the New Testament that God was working on, restoring his church. So, this is where I, this is not only where I am, it's where I, this is my life. I wouldn't dream about going back into Babylon. I would consider that. Where, well, how could I do that? They don't, they, none of these truths will be taught. You'll never hear none of them out there. Anyway, I uh, just wanted to mention that today. We're out of time, but uh, let's take a break. We'll go upstairs and have our worship service. It's good to be back in church today. Good to have Bible study again. We got Christmas coming up, so everybody be careful, you know, be in your planning because even though these vaccines are coming, they still say it's going to be probably the third quarter before we start seeing a slowdown in this of 21. So let's all keep wearing our mask and being careful in space as we can and keep praying.